thanks a lot. I will speak in English. I hope you don't mind. They didn't accept Frisian. Um, so, um, my name is Cor van der Meer. I said thank you, Xabi, for, that, for your introduction. I'm working for the Frisk Academy, but especially for a spe uh, specified uh, department of the Frisk Academy, which is called Mercator, the Mercator European Research Center for, for Multilingualism and Language Learning. Uh, I, should not, I could not be here without explaining a few things about the, uh, the work Mercator is doing. Uh, so I will spend a few words on the Mercator European Research Center, uh, then about the Frisian language management, a few items which are, I think, pretty much in context also and, and fill in some details which were discussed this morning. Um, some of the current trends and challenges as we see them, as, as we experience them for the Frisian language, and I hope to conclude with some uh, information and some, some implications, what that could mean for us. So, on the uh, Mercator Research Center, um, started in 1987, uh, more than 30 years ago now, on, on uh, initiative of the European Commission. We work together as a network, uh, but since that time, uh, the Mercator Center in Leeuwarden uh, is hosted at the Frisk Academy. In general, we do research, publications, what the whole list, as you can see, that the network of schools, the network of schools contains more than, uh, or more than 100 schools are members. All these schools, different levels, are um, m uh, based in multilingual regions, working with more than one language in their curriculum uh, as a medium of instruction. Uh, we provide newsletters every monthly and for the network of schools every three months. We do a lot of projects. I will show you just an example later on. We organize quite regularly conferences and seminars, and that I grab this opportunity again to invite you all to the ICML, the International Conference on Lang uh, Minority Languages, which is being organized in Leeuwarden, the capital of Friesland, in May, upcoming May to, uh, 22 to 24 in uh, um, 2019. So. Uh, I hope to see at least some of your faces there. And, of course, we have an advisory role that counts for the um, ministries, of, uh, or regional authorities, but also for the European Commission. It's one of our last uh, policy documents is being uh, the front of that displayed, uh, which was a research for the cult committee on minority languages and uh, best practices and pitfalls. So... Um, <clears throat> On publications, uh, one of our most familiar and, and uh, famous uh, publications are these kind of regional dossiers. We have more than 50 dossiers at the moment describing more than 50 situations of minority language in education systems. So um, the, every um, document and dossier is available online, so you can download them. Uh, it's, it's a very rich source for further research but also uh, if you want to have a comparison with your own system, for example, you can download them for free. We try to update them uh, every 10 years. Uh, on our website, you can also find our research reports, which are normally public available, um, several issues on language status, implementation of the charter, we have recently done one on that, uh, the changing and or merging of um, let's say, political structures, uh, in this case, municipalities in Friesland. We will talk about that later on. Um, and the report you just saw on, on um, education. Did I, uh -huh. Sorry, something happened. Some of the projects we do at the moment, this is just to grab a few, uh, the Combi project on communication competence for migrants. Migrants is an important issue now in, in Europe. The, uh, that's why we also use this term. Of course, we have an advantage because we, we know what multilingualism is, but also bringing in people in a multilingual area, like in the Basque Country or in Friesland, does have an uh, impact on the language. So that these uh, kind of projects also, we work closely together with El Huyar, which is one of the organizations also in the best country. Uh, teaching in diversity also has a close connection with uh, the influx of, of immigrants or, or refugees in the classrooms. Um, we'll come back to some of these issues later on, just to give you an example. So if you go to Frisian language management, um, 
By the way, I, I guess you all know the map a little bit of Friesland, um, as we call it. It's part of the Netherlands. Uh, the, it's one of the 11 provinces. It's up uh, north. And it also has these islands, which is a continuing row almost till uh, Denmark with, uh, 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 with islands. We speak the, the West Frisian variety of uh, Frisian. In Germany, we have also an area where the uh, East Frisian is spoken, and close to Denmark, also a part which we call North Frisian is spoken there. So there's three uh, branches of the tree, so to speak, of the Frisian language, a Germanic language. But it also has close connections to, uh, with Old Frisian language, uh, so the Old English language. Many words in our language are the same as, and sometimes still used in um, uh, English. Just to give you an uh, idea of, of the, um, uh, the status of the language at the moment, um, we have about 650,000 inhabitants in this province, and about 50%, a little bit more than 50% of the people have the Frisian language as, mo as a mother tongue. But as you can see, a lot of people say that at least they can understand the language um, and speak, it goes slowly backwards, as well as reading skills and writing skills. Um, there is a slight difference in the, the year, so I, I blame this difference in numbers also to the methodology used at that point. But at least you, it has an, you have an idea of how many people approximately can uh, speak the language or understand the language. For the language itself, the Frisian language, it has, uh, it has been mentioned this morning, the, uh, uh, makes, um, it's the only language in the Netherlands which has been rat um, ratified under the Charter for Regional and Minority Languages under Path 3. Was it Mikkel uh, or was it uh, Jeroen explained about this this morning that if you are uh, rec recognized and, and ratified under Path 3, you have this menu system, like different me measurements. The minimum is 35. Uh, the Netherlands has uh, used 48 in total of these measurements, and um, it's the only language which makes it the only sec the second official state language of the Netherlands, but only for the region of Friesland. Uh, in part two, there are also other languages, as Lower Saxon, Romani, Yiddish, and Limburgish, which are recognized under that part. But that means it's only kind of recognition, not that they receive any funding or whatever, or any support to maintain their language. But it, the, the Charter for Regional Minority Languages is, is, is a basic document for us. And based on that, we, uh, we make a special covenant with the um, uh, national government in The Hague, with the provincial government, which uh, take this charter as an example, as a basic document, and further wor wor work through all the measurements which are taken and undersigned under these um, part three, and they will make, they have some, a new document which is called the covenant between uh, the four um, language and culture of Friesland. So that is where the details are being described. We just have uh, signed a new one, which is only, normally it's for 10 years, this time it's for five years. I don't know why, but uh, for 2018 till 2023. And I'm happy to say that at least we have set these goals. Um, we have these goals at the horizon, so to speak. We want to be there in 2030. We want to have that many children who speak, or that many, we want to have that many schools and so on. So this is actually the first time that there is this kind of positive uh, atmosphere between the national government and the regional government as well, and with positive uh, goals in mind. So that, um, this is also the first time that we have a very positive commissioner of the king we have, that's a kind of the boss of the province, and the, the national government, which has now, we have a minister who, or, who, uh, whose family, family originates from the Swedish-Finnish area, where, as you probably know, also different uh, minority languages are spoken. So she's just very open to this issue. And so we have a very positive atmosphere at this moment created between the national government and the local government in uh, uh, trying to achieve new goals. 
And that's why the reason why we have a positive document now, this covenant between uh, the national government and province of Friesland. So as said, this is a result of the ratification of the charter. And for, uh, as I said, for every domain, every me measurement, a special action has been uh, described. Since the 1st of January 2014, we also, the Friesian language also have a law for the use of Friesian language, as it is being called. It's the, the official document. It originates a little bit more from the uh, Framework Convention for National Minorities, which also was re um, ratified by the Dutch government in 2006, I believe. Also, another document which states in the, the, um, in the law, in, in the Constitution even, that Frisian is the official second language of the Netherlands, but in the area of Friesland, only in the area of Friesland. So uh, it, it states at least where we have, that we have the right to use the language in court, in official administration, in, uh, with the police, or when we have to dial uh, 112 or 911, as the Americans say, the, 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 the emergency number, so to speak. Uh, these kind of situations happen that, uh, happened before, at least, that someone on the other side didn't recognize what you were saying in Frisian. So uh, uh, somebody could be dead for that reason. So now it's uh, official that there is, needs to be someone who can speak the Frisian language. And we have a new organ which took place of the Brief for the Frisk, which was a kind of official um, um, club um, uh, council for the Frisian language. This is a new one, which is being um, enforced between the uh, national government. And so they are supposed to be in between and negotiate between the national government and the local, uh, regional government. If we move onwards to uh, challenges, I use this fish to show that uh, we sometimes have the feeling that we are being eaten almost by a uh, bigger language, and, and sometimes even the Dutch language is almost being eaten by English because at high schools nowadays, most colleges are now in English instead of in Dutch, for example. So, um, of course, then the Frisian fish is very small and can easily be eaten, uh, but also uh, Another issue is, of course, migrant languages. We face uh, everywhere in Europe that we have many more migrants uh, around, and um, there's, uh, migration is happening everywhere. That's not to our country or your country, it's everywhere. So the, and also minority languages need to have some kind of, in our case, what we call respect. Because we have done some... Um, Oh, yeah, this, I'm sorry, yeah, that, uh, I forgot about this, but this is the example that uh, slowly shows that we are um, increasing as the population of Friesland. The only, uh, no, decreasing, I'm sorry. The increase from population is only uh, thanks to uh, migration that we have people coming in the province. And, of course, the rural areas were um, mostly less hit by these uh, migration uh, waves but that changes quite rapidly. And so we have uh, quite, an, uh, in the Netherlands it's 22% at the moment, in Friesland only nine, but in Leeuwarden, the capital, 17%. So it, it's increasing, and it's also increasing a worry for some people saying, yeah, what is the influence on our language? What, what, what will happen? And I know you have the same discussion also here in the Basque country. So, um, we had a rather big debate and, and research going on in the Netherlands um, to see what can we do in such a situation, what should we do actually, because the Council of Europe also said, um, we agree with that after the research, that also migrant languages should have some kind of respect, otherwise they will also deny almost certainly the language is spoken at the region. So in that's, uh, for that reason we had to think about new, the, the, these developments and new ways of teaching. Um, because we had, of course, our, and we were very happy with it, the trilingual education system. It's only, uh, I'm talking now about 20% of the schools who have this trilingual education system, where Frisian language, Dutch, and English are being used as medium of instruction. Uh, we were very happy with that, but then 
uh, schools came to us and said, yeah, what can we do? We have now uh, children in the classroom only speaking Arabic or, or Polish or, or what, what Berber or whatever. And so there was a lot of uh, discussion also from the schools, bottom up, so to speak. What can we do with them? We have three languages, but it's not enough. So um, in that sense, we, we um, tried and are still working on um, like a continuum of multilingual education. And I freely use now the examples of my colleague, Joana Duarte, who is working in this sense of, uh, in this field, where there is a big gap between acknowledgement of languages and, and knowing that they are there to the use in, in, in instruction. So, um, and for Friesland, that meant that we have a big, uh, let's say, a basic uh, level where language awareness is being brought to children so that they understand that there are more languages. Uh, and then the intercomprehension that people, that the children learn a, a bit about the differences. Uh, they also learn a little bit about how to count, for example, in Arabic. The ch children go to these which are going to these schools now know how to count in Polish and also now kn know how to count in Arabic. But that's a simple way. It's not used as instruction because, of course, the teachers, of course, don't know anything about these languages. So that we, I, I will f make it full. We used as an immersion, of course, Frisian, Dutch, and English in these languages in these schools. But there is a whole continuum possible in how you can introduce more than one language uh, in, in the classroom. And we have only positive reactions with that. Uh, it also means that the little children who came from, I don't know where, maybe from Iran or something, sitting in a corner, uh, not knowing that, uh, and, and no self-esteem at all, at all that when they have, are being allowed to at least let other children hear how they count in their language, they grow and they have a, a, a much higher, uh, let's say, self-esteem and also more willing to learn other languages. They accept the differences, they learn the differences. So this is one of the uh, issues what we, um, what we strongly work on because education is also one of our main uh, issues where we do research on. Other developments in the Frisian area, at least, are that uh, the government is looking for bigger structures, bigger, bigger um, municipalities in our case, where they merge municipalities together. And that is sometimes a problem, also for a language, because we have, in most cases, these uh, municipalities have a language uh, kind of act, so to speak, how they work and how they, what they publish and so on. And then they are being merged, sometimes with a municipality who is not having that good, uh, let's say, regulations. According to the charter, they should, let's say, adopt the regulations from the better one. But in practice, it doesn't happen. In practice, it's, it's, a, it's way beyond their, their, their goal. I don't know if, if that is something which is happening over here, that you talk about these issues, but we, we see this happening a lot, that uh, the municipalities are suffering and we, the, in the end, the Frisian language is being put down in, in regulations and in uh, language acts. So, uh, and of course, it's even worse when, uh, when you go across language borders that you are more merging other areas where there is no interest or perhaps other languages in some cases. Um, these kind of things, I, I wanted to just to mention them, and we also do research on like new technology like the translation tools, spell checkers, uh, uh, collection of data. Uh, we also already work with that on, on, on social linguistic clustera, uh, on issues like this. And uh, so this, this, but these are important issues which count for everybody, for, for all the minorities. And we can all have a kind of, uh, have an advantage to, with each other to study these uh, and research these issues. Social media, of course, is of a high and enormous amount of issues. Social media could be one of these, uh, what was mentioned this morning, uh, a secret way around to motivate people to use the language again. In our research, it shows that young people on social media use the Frisian language, but they don't have the tools. So what happens, and they don't know to write it sometimes, they just write it down as they think they should write it down. But they use it because it's, thank you, they use it because it's, it's so close to their heart. It's a, using WhatsApp is like talking to each other. 
It's not like a formal letter or something. Uh, so it, uh, and then w when they use WhatsApp, in many, many cases, they use Frisian language again. So you want to help them. You want to give them the tools to make it even easier or to write in a better way. On these kind of um, uh, issues, I think we can l learn from each other, I think. So if I come to the end of my presentation, conclusion and implications, that is the most important thing. The charter remains one of the best um, instruments for, for, for uh, making new policy and uh, think about language planning and so on. Uh, although it is a bit outdated in my opinion, and I think many of us agree on that, but it's still the best instrument. And also the Council of Europe is thinking about how we could improve perhaps, how we could uh, use other domains and how we could describe certain terms in a better way than it has, was done before. So, um, migration is an issue, as I said before, it's a European issue or even beyond Europe. It's not from one region or one uh, issue. There are many, many uh, multilingual regions hit by these, uh, uh, um, these um, developments. So, in my opinion, we should work together and see what, what, else, what we can do about it. I've shown you some of the results and work we have done, but there is more possible. Uh, technology, social media, and, and they all have international dimension. So I'm only here actually to plea for um, that we can learn from each other. Uh, and that's why I, I propose to you all, let's work together. Uh, not only sharing best practices, because that is easy, and we can learn from that as well, but we can also learn from worst practices as well. Why does it work over here and why doesn't it work over there? These are issues we need to solve together, in my opinion. So that is, um, there are in, en enough institutions uh, and, and networks available in, in, um, in Europe who can help us and assist us and the information is there. We also are working on a new academic network or language academies. This is one reason why we should work together and share this information with each other. Uh, so, it is important, this cooperation between us, and to my opinion, also necessary. And that brings me to the end, so thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>